Okay. So somebody asked me, who picked these top three Thanksgiving hymns? I did. <laughs> That's it. That's, I, just pulled, I just picked my, my favorite. So I should have called the sermon series that, you know, my favorite three Thanksgiving hymns. They're all good ones, including tonight's. And our, our text for tonight is Psalm 65. But before we get to that, we want to just think about the, the hymn selection for tonight. It's come, you thankful people, come which when you, when you first sing it, it sounds like it, the scripture that's right over it in the hymnal, uh, Psalm 65, the one we're looking at, and verse 11, the first half of verse 11 says, you crown the year with your bounty. It turns out, though, that the hymn is actually about something much bigger than the big blessing that the big meal so many of us are going to enjoy tomorrow is, or what, what it represents. And if you can pick up on that, uh, go ahead and, and try to. A lot of people miss that when they, when they sing this, because... It sounds a little like a cereal commercial. You got grains, you got corn, you got wheat, all mentioned in the, uh, in the hymn. And so you can, you can maybe miss what the writer was after. Well, let me talk to you about the writer. It's uh, Henry Alford, and he was a, a hardworking guy. I mean, he was a, a reverend, doctor of divinity. He was a, an author. He spent 20 years uh, writing out a, a new edition of the Greek Testament, you know, for, for people to understand. And he wrote all these hymns and all these poems. And uh, the, the write-ups about him are, are a little rough because they say that most, basically to sum up, most of his hymns aren't that good. So, I mean, I don't know why, you know, as a hymn writer, he added little to his literary reputation. <laughs> The rhythm of his hymns is musical, but the poetry is neither striking nor the thought original. Okay. They are evangelical in their teaching, but somewhat cold and conventional. They vary greatly in merit. That sounds like something a teacher would have wrote, written about something, you know, my work during the semester. The most popular, though, is, of course, the one we're looking at today. And uh, it really is about not just... Uh, the physical harvest. So if you're ready, I'm going to call the, the team back up, and I've got the lyrics right there. There's the first set. I'll leave it. Here they come, and they're going to sing this. I have my hymnal out. I know you don't, but if you happen to carry a hymnal with you, you're, I don't know, probably you need some help, but <laughs> it's number 797 in the hymnal. But uh, come, you thankful people, come. You ready? You ready to sing it out? All right. You probably know it. You want to stand? Yeah, I would stand. There we go. Ready? You know it. Come, ye thankful people, come, raise the song. from 
to myself I said basically when it came to him writing he, he wasn't that good apparently kind of a one-hit wonder but what a mind he had he had this great theological mind and what industry he worked hard and he wrote a ton of hymns and it's just there's something there about not not worrying about what level of talent you have if you want to do something just do it and get about doing it and uh, it'll be the work that counts amen and so that's that's part of the lesson from his life. And he talked about the harvest, and you realize, well, this is not, I mean, if you came here, I mean, we're almost a church, a Presbyterian church, 300 years. It's 2029, it'll be 300 years. Most of those 300 years, he would have sang that song the Sunday before Thanksgiving, if not at the Thanksgiving Eve service, if we had one. But you realize it's not about Thanksgiving Day, is it? It's about Judgment Day. Did you pick up on that? <laughs> Reading through, you're like, wait a minute. This is about something bigger. And it reminds us, again, that the greatest thing we're thankful for is Jesus. And that really, as I read that proclamation, that was the intent of the day. Yes, we want to enjoy a great meal and enjoy family. And all that is really symbolic. It's like an illustration of God's provision, his ultimate provision of his son and how everything else flows from that. You know, seek me and I'll add all this other stuff to you, great stuff, but nothing greater, nothing more important than me. So, so says God. So you, you look at this and you think, I like that. How does that help me for today? You know, because some of us, I mean, maybe some of us, I hope not, feel like Thanksgiving Day is a little bit like Judgment Day. So anybody, anybody? So yeah, a couple of you are like, that's, that's me. It's the pastor speaking to me tonight. So uh, I, there's some wrath and some corners, right? Definitely. Maybe not God's, maybe a relative's, you know? Or maybe it's the wrathful judgment of circumstances. That I think a lot of people feel the pinch of that because now here come the holidays and it just feels like circumstances are closing in. I think others of us just feel a wrath towards ourselves. You know, we, we just are, are, are not, we're, we, we can't stand to be in the room with ourselves, you know? And for all this, Psalm 65 provides a targeted, timeless comfort. So let's just take a look at this great psalm, Psalm 65. Again, that first little line there, that's a verse in Scripture in the Hebrew. So it looks like a 13-verse psalm, but if you have your Hebrew, you read it in Hebrew, it's 14 verses, and that little line, to the choir master, a psalm of David, a song, that's Scripture, because it matters. Where did this come from? It came from David, the heart of David. And he says, praise is due you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. So I think that Seward, Lincoln, the, the, the woman who wrote the presidents, including uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think all these people had this in mind, that wait a minute, we have to praise him. Praise is due him. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's going on in my life or in the world or in the news, he's owed praise. And to you shall vows be performed, O you who hear prayer. To you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. So that's about, that's salvation right there. Iniquities, atonement, transgressions. This is the biblical language describing salvation, the operation of salvation, if you will. And if we're receiving that, then we are to see ourselves as chosen. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't choose him, he chose us. And that's important. You want your, your salvation to be based on God and God's work. You want it to rely on him and not yourself. Amen? Right? I remember somebody gave me a choice and ways to think about 
uh, by Christian faith, where you can either rely on God and trust that he's going to take you all the way, or you can say, I'm going to keep myself there. And I said, well, uh, that second option is never going to work for me. I didn't get myself there. I wasn't even interested. And I think I would just, I would fall off. I would fall off this thing immediately unless he was hanging on to me. And he was, he was holding me and carrying me all the way through. Amen? And so that's what it is to be chosen. It's, it's the, the, the most humbling of thoughts, you know, because you, you realize I, I, I gave nothing to this. There's no part of this arrangement that I contributed to, and I'm baffled. Like, why would I even have the thought of God? Why would I be grateful? I live in a world that's bitter all around, inviting me to join in the bitterness, to be angry, to be hateful, uh, to, to be selfish, to... to to look down on other human beings and see them as an obstacle. They're in my way. I don't want them. I want it, whatever it is. Not them. Oh, there's something changed, though. God did a work in me. And, I mean, blessed is the one, indeed, chosen. And that's the, that's the sentiment of David. And he knew this. We're chosen to be with him. And we are to feel ourselves chosen. That's the thing that you want to enjoy tonight and tomorrow and really into the season of Advent, that you know him, that you're interested in him, that you care, that when you hear about heaven and hell, you want heaven, you know? And when you hear about Jesus dying on the cross, you say, he did that for me. You know, when you look at all the pictures of, you know, representing his birth, you, you think, he came for me. He came for me. I don't deserve it. I don't, I didn't earn it. Nevertheless, he said it. He promised it. It's in his word. I believe it. I can't believe I believe it, but I believe it, and that's the work of God in my life, and I'm grateful. I'm blessed. Amen? Yes. Uh, he continues, the psalmist, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. There's that word satisfied again. We saw that uh, this last weekend in Psalm 63, satisfied. One of my favorite songs by Bob Dylan is uh, it's called A Satisfied Mind. He didn't write it, but he sang it on one of his three Jesus albums. Anyone here old enough to know anything about who Bob Dylan is? Who even knows who that is? Yeah, all right. And he had a Christian phase, although he might still be Christian, but he had three albums that were definitely that, and this was kind of the middle one, I think. And the first song on that album was A Satisfied Mind. I got a satisfied mind. That's what you want. You're going to be satisfied. You're going to probably get enough to eat tomorrow. That's my prediction. It's my prophecy. <laughs> you might get enough to eat tomorrow. You might feel full. Well, feel that way spiritually, even though your life's a mess. Maybe especially if your life's a mess. Jesus is drawn to that mess. That mess is attractive to him. He wants to get in that mess with you. So uh, be satisfied. Like I, I know God's going to get me through this. I know that God's got me. I know that God's forgiving me and he's forgiven me in the past and his forgiveness is the, is the thing I can count on. I, I can't count on myself, but I can count on him and his forgiveness. That satisfies me. By awesome deeds you answer us, answer us with righteousness. O oh God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. So you get a picture of creation illustrating redemption. You look around and you see the art of God everywhere. And the art of God has a motif it has a message, and that message is that God loves you. He's after you. He wants you. He will save you. He will keep his promise to you. It's great stuff, isn't it? And, and I like the, the thing here. It says, oh, God of our salvation. Like, that stood out to me when I was reading this because there's all kinds of so-called gods, right, all these little gods, but there's only one God of our salvation, only one displayed in the fullness of Scripture as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything and everyone is accountable to him. And the thought continues at the bottom of verse 7 in the next verse. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. 
So more nature, more creation here. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain. For so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. It's like the scripture, poetic portrayal of rain, right? Like rain on a dry land. This would be especially meaningful to the author, especially meaningful to the people from which uh, this psalm comes, because these are people of the desert, of the dry wilderness. And so to have that rain fall. Like yesterday, it was snowing. Did you see that? It was snowing, and then it turned to rain, you know? And it was, it was kind of neat, and then it wasn't. And then, because uh, you're like, oh boy, here we go, right? <laughs> but it's, it, we need it, you know? Uh, we, we need that spiritually, that refreshment, that, that life-giving water, you know? He meets our needs. Again, beginning with and really ending with our greatest need. And uh, faith, it recruits our imagination, you know? It, it's like we stand in the desert. Like the, he's standing in the desert and he's picturing this. He's standing in the desert and picturing a garden. And he's thanking God in advance for turning this desert into a garden. I know you're going to do it. You said you're going to do it. I rejoice that you're going to do it. Praise you, Lord God, that you're going to do it. I thank you in advance for your kept promises and answered prayers and, and infinite blessings. And they really are infinite. So a Christian feast begins and ends with Christ. And the abundance at the table always, and really we have abundance at the table uh, before us as well. And you'll have abundance tomorrow or however you celebrate uh, Thanksgiving. Some are having meals on different nights, different days. You're having you know, different meals with family members as, as it can be worked out. In all of that, see it as symbolic of the abundance that's in Christ, the abundance that's available to your soul. It's totally disconnected with your circumstances. Totally, it has nothing to do with your health, nothing to do with what's going on at work, nothing to do with the family members that you're sitting around the table with, all right? Those are all, those are your, those are mission fields maybe, <laughs> you know, some of that. It's, it's, but it's, it's all good, it's all great because you have Christ. And he's satisfying you and you're experiencing and enjoying his abundance. That's what David, King David, is inviting you to do. And the, the psalm concludes, you crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. I don't know why I thought this. I was thinking, because I've gained a little weight. I know you've been very nice not to say anything about it. And some of you are really enjoying that. I gained a little weight. Thank you for that. But, uh, so I thought this is a great, instead of talking about like love handles and beer belly, I, don't, I mean, lots of other things contribute. Anything can contribute to the belly anymore. You know, just, just enough of whatever it is, right? Amen? Tomorrow you'll have enough of something, right? Probably, and too much of some other things, right? So I'm thinking, no, I, I, here's another way to think about it. You know, I got my wagon tracks overflowing with abundance right here, right? You know, my, my hills have girded themselves with joy, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's just a picture of like abundance. And I thought, well, you know what? God is good, you know? And life is, uh, there are seasons, right? There are seasons where you're full and other seasons where it, it's less so. But in all, whatever season you're going through right now, whatever season your family is going through, uh, God will bring you to this place. You know, this is your destiny in Christ. Overflowing, clothed, girded, decked, shouting and singing. It's good stuff. It's way more than the human idea of prosperity. That's so thin. So shallow, so emaciated, right? No, this is true fullness. And the kind of fullness that you don't, you don't even need to have the meal be great for the meal to be great, amen? You don't, you don't need that. And watch how it works. Lean into it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Maybe it is difficult with family. Maybe there's some other difficulty. Be there in that difficulty and trust God, this God, the God of the Bible, 
to, to make you feel full in the midst of that, even though it's a situation where you're, you're tempted to feel very empty and, and, and not provided for. You are not empty. You are provided for. We walk through different valleys together, but we, we get through all of them. And this, this idea of harvest, it really gives us a good way to think about eternity and our, and our lives, you know, because the food and the farming illustrations in the hymn and, and, the, and the creation illustration here in the psalm, well, it's about more than creation. It's about more than, than food and farming. These are illustrations of life and how life works by God's design. You know, we reap what we sow, except for salvation, which involves that which we as sinners cannot sow. God sows it, and only in this way is salvation reaped. But God, too, reaps what he sows, us. You know, so it's about a harvest. That's what the, that's what the hymn was about. That's what uh, Henry Alford was, was talking about, this, this ultimate harvest. And it's way more important than a yearly harvest for food, as important as that is. It's about the harvest that is a purpose of human history and, and your history. It's about where you're going to spend forever. And, and your peace can come from that. So come, ye thankful people, come. It has that deeper meaning. Like, like all the rest of these expressions of our faith, if we let them in, I too can be cynical. I too can be over-focused on circumstances. And, and you, you lose track of God. He always means the circumstances to follow. And if, if, you, if you first go to God, then your circumstances look different, don't they? They really do. I learned this early on. My first handful of lifetime Christian saints who were on their deathbeds, dying of cancer or something else, and I'm going to the hospital room, and I don't know what to say. And I learned what to say, and it's not really about what you say. That's what you always say to me. Some of you are like, what do you say in a situation like that? Well, you, you don't really say something. You're there. You be there. You listen. You pray. You talk with somebody. And I remember the first several times I did this, I, I, I felt like sad for the person that I'm visiting. And kind of like, well... I, I would be, I'm a little scared that this, this might happen to me. And then when I'm done with the encounter, I don't feel sad for the person at all. And if I'm to be fair about what happened in that hospital room, I was the recipient of ministry as I got encouraged because somebody was looking at their circumstances through the eyes of faith and they were laying on that hospital bed grateful for life and grateful for Jesus Christ and grateful that they had been trusted with this adversity and grateful for the opportunity to encourage me. A young, really young, I was young once, a young pastor who didn't know what he was doing, you know? Don't mean that, I don't mean to imply that I know what I'm doing now. I just was young and not knowing, I didn't know what I was doing back then, you know? And it was real. It wasn't, somebody, somebody wasn't faking it, you know, uh, faking it until you make it. It was real. And if I was sad for anyone when I walked out of those hospital rooms, it was me. Like, what am I thinking? Like, they get it. They're, they're, they're seeing Jesus clearly. I can see it in their eyes. I can hear it in their voice. And this is not a time for pity. This is not a time for uh, fear. It's not a time for, for regret. Well, there's no, no regret. That's the thing I saw most. These people hadn't lived perfect lives. God doesn't require us to live perfect lives. He requires us to give our very imperfect lives over to him. Amen? Amen. So as you take that meal, as you receive that meal tomorrow, say, look, I'm going to prepare a plate for you, Jesus, and I'm on the plate. And it's not delicious. It's a mess. It's terrible. Uh, it, it's who I am. I'm going to give that to you. And God will consume that. He will take that. He'll do something with that. And oh, the difference, the difference that, that faith makes in this situation. You know, if you could see the details of your life through the lens of forever, your life might seem very different. 
you know? And if, if, if you're on hard times right now, you're, you're tempted to doubt or despair or be bitter or cynical or angry, be grateful instead. Be grateful that whatever God is doing with your life, he's doing for reasons that are bigger than your life. You may not be that impressed with your life, you know, but know that you are far more important to God than your life is to you. And you matter to him more than all that other stuff matters to you. 10,000 years from now, you won't complain about what God did with you or to you in your life. Instead, you will rejoice in what God did for you and through your life, the good parts and the bad, maybe especially the bad. Your life, whatever you think of it right now, is part of what God is using to keep the rest of his promises to you, promises that extend beyond the end of time. And it's hard to think about this stuff sometimes because you're facing winter of one kind or another, you're enduring loss, even in questioning, you know, we, we, we do this, we question the benefits of faith sometimes, and, and maybe that's what you're going through. Because the truth is, uh, even people of faith don't like faith per se. You know, we, we don't want it. We want what we can see, hear, taste, and, and touch. We want that now. Silence and darkness and, and empty hands sometimes get the better of us. But that's what faith is on the hard days. It's silence that knows a song is coming. It's, it's, it's darkness knowing that a light will soon shine. It's empty hands knowing that they will be filled. And better than that, they know the one who will fill those hands. So it's, it's harvest. You know, it's, it, hope is unseen. It's, it's deferred for now. You wait for it. It's invisible, but it will be realized. That's our faith. And that's, that's the, the harvest, the harvest to come. It's, it's harvest that is final and glorious, as the hymn writer wrote, waiting for us in the future on the other side of eternity. And tonight, our songs and psalms of harvest point us once again, with gratitude to Christ's table, to Christ's cross. So let me pray, and Pastor Jose will come up and officiate, you know, serve communion to us all. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, and we are grateful. There is no case that can be made against gratitude for the Christian believer, and we know it. And we, whatever is holding any of us back tonight, would you, you, would you break it apart, break through that? Uh, whatever is darkness in our experience of our life in you, whatever makes us feel and worse than that, believe that we're defeated, Lord, just remove that, replace it. Because we're going to do what you've commanded us to do. We're going we're gonna to do something in remembrance of you. We're going to look at the bread and the cup and not see the bread or the cup, but see the cross and see what you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.